Mostly, I think, from the Monero Policy Working Group, and we're going to talk a little bit about um, emerging cryptocurrency regulations, and to talk about potential impacts, and, and potential ideas for, for creating change. Um, I think we can start maybe with, with a little introduction from everybody. Um, so I'll start myself quickly. I'm, I'm MIDI Poet. Um, I kind of was one of the initial founders, I guess, of the Monero Policy Working Group. Essentially, it's just a group of us got together, we started seeing the regulatory space evolving and we felt that we needed to have or try and have a say in the conversation as it developed. So from there, we responded to a number of consultations, public consultations, uh, and we tried to just have a voice and, and hopefully we weren't just shouting into the void. Um, we started that in about 2019, uh, it went on for about two or three years, I guess. Uh, and we probably in total responded to about uh, six public consultations um, and that's kind of brought us to where we are here. So uh, I'll pass on to Artic Mine if you want to give a quick intro. Um, I'm Artic Mine, I'm one of the members of the Monero Policy Group um, and I got involved primarily because I was very concerned about some types of regulations and what their impact on Monero are. Well. Um, so that's kind of my, why I'm here. Um, I'm Amber Scott. I'm the founder and CEO at Outlier Compliance Group. Um, we essentially try to keep folks out of trouble. Um, we also do public consultations and, and work with a number of different governments and regulatory groups. And I will say, I know it feels sometimes like shouting into the void, um, but in talking to our regulators and our policymakers, they do have folks that read every submission. And if there's any academics in the room who've ever done a coalition of survey data or things like that, that's kind of the thing that they do. So not everybody reads every submission, but they have specific people that are tasked with collating that data that they get back from the submissions and bubbling that up to the people that are actually the pen holders. So the more that there are people that care about privacy rights, that care about individual civil liberties that are commenting on these things, the better it is, um, in, in my opinion. So thank you for the work that you do in that regard. Hello everyone, my name is uh, Andrea. I joined the uh, Monero Policy Working Group uh, last year uh, in, uh, uh, after MoneroCon in uh, Lisbon. And uh, I'm just a teacher and I'm just trying to, providing, uh, to, uh, to provide some uh, philosophical insights into, uh, into the work of the group. And uh, uh, I'm really grateful for the work uh, the, that they're doing because I'm learning a lot in uh, engaging with uh, these people. So uh, that's it. <coughs> Great, and hi everybody. Uh, I'm Deanna, or Tito D online, um, and yeah, member of the Monero Policy Working Group since the beginning as well. Uh, happy to be a part of uh, the discussions around regulatory, the regulatory environment, where policy is heading, uh, helping to inform, educate, and at the very least review uh, certain regulations that are coming out. I'm a global political economist by my academic trade, and I generally have been working a as an entrepreneur applying blockchain and various tech in uh, an industry. But uh, yeah, it's about me. Hello everyone, I'm Justin Ehrenhofer. I'm from Cakewall, the Vice President of Operations there. I have a kind of interesting background because I started writing ways to you know, publish breaking Monero series and was familiar with a lot of the Monero background there. And then after college, I worked in cryptocurrency compliance for an OTC trading desk for two years and that gave me a pretty good oversight on what other exchanges were doing for their other compliance programs, having been the one who had to evaluate them, go through them, and so it gave me a pretty good worldwide view. And I've also contributed to a lot of the policy working group things, had a lot of discussions with uh, other members in the space about policy-related discussions, and I think it's very important for us to sit down 
And I know that not everyone's always going to agree with every single view that comes out of the policy working group, but I think that our views that we've put down pen to paper and the responses are actually much better on point than I think many other policy working groups in even the cryptocurrency space are. So um, I'm really excited to be a part of the group and having a very privacy focused mindset, but also a very pragmatic focused mindset that uh, I think a lot of other people in the space don't get direct exposure to you like you would in the Monero community. Okay, so we, we, we've kind of said a dirty word twice, compliance. I think you said it, Justin, and you probably mentioned it. So I'm, I'm going to start with you, Justin. So kind of where are we? Like, what is the environment looking like now? Um, what's your perspective of it? Sure, so I'm, I'm in the U.S., so I only have some like secondhand exposure to a lot of stuff happening in the EU. But I would say for the last year, discussions in the United States on compliance have focused on securities regulation, at least in terms of news, as opposed to previous conversations that got our work to group together regarding FinCEN, uh, anti-money laundering type uh, proposals. Those proposals are still ongoing in the United States. They still occur. They're still revising them, making improvements, changes. Uh, one major change, for example, in the United States is that there is more reporting on who owns businesses directly to the U.S. government because they wanted to homogenize that type of process instead of having your you know, completely anonymous Wyoming LLC, but trusts are still exempt because of course they are. Um, but um, yeah, the main focus in the United States has been on securities. I would say in the EU recently, the focus, as far as I can tell, has been a little bit more on the AML side, anti-money laundering side specifically, because there are some proposals going through and, and being discussed. Um, but those are not going away on the United States side. Those discussions will continue. It's just taking a backseat compared to 2019 when there was the midnight rulemaking, for example. Fair. And I, I think on, on the international stage, if you're not reading publications that come out from the Financial Action Task Force on the anti-money laundering side, then you're not really seeing where the puck is going, to use a Canadian euphemism in, in that regard. Uh, there is a lot of commentary, um, and that's specific to anti-money laundering, about what's referred to in that space as anonymity enhancing technology, and I find that nomenclature particularly interesting. Um, in that the conversation isn't about privacy enhancement, it's not about privacy protection, um, it's about anonymity enhancing technology, and that's the language that's used in that space. Um, currently, the emphasis is really on centralized finance, um, but there are really interesting things um, happening in terms of the discussion of decentralized finance and what that looks like, discussions about how that should be regulated, um, and it's, I don't think that it's a question of if, and that's probably going to be a very unpopular position in this room, but the conversation in a regulatory context is really about how do we regulate that? How do we protect people? Um, the conversations in our context have been, in, in the context of this conference, have been very much about regulatory attacks. And I think it's important to preface that regulators don't see it that way in their thinking. They don't see their actions as being an attack on privacy or an attack on an individual. They see themselves as having the responsibility to protect society and to protect individuals. And you can agree with that or disagree with that, but I need you to understand that that's the perspective that exists in those policymaker circles. And I think sometimes in, um, and, and this isn't specific to Monero, I will say this about virtual currency generally, we don't do ourselves any favors in terms of some of the types of commentary that we make publicly. Um, and, and I'll give a non-crypto example of this. You can use a knife for a whole bunch of things. You can use it to cut a steak, you can use it to cut an apple, you can use it to stab people. But I don't see a lot of knife companies advertising themselves as the best knife for stabbing. Um, but in the crypto sphere, we do have things where um, immediately someone will jump in on a commentary and be like, oh, you should have used a particular virtual currency or a particular protocol to avoid sanctions or to do something that's law violating. And I, I think it's naive of communities to think that those aren't things that regulators are also paying attention to and that when they see these things, they look at it and say, how do we protect people? Um, how, how do we deal with these things? And I'll, I'll leave that there as food for thought. 
I mean, that was a great response, Hamna, thanks. But I think it's important to note that like the technology itself is multi-purpose use, right? So then it ends up asking the question or at least begging the question to be asked about whether or not there should be different rules for different implementations of the technology. So I don't know if any of you have any views on that. Should we be viewing cryptocurrencies different from securities entirely or should they be packaged together? Yeah, go ahead. Um, well, I, I kind of feel that there's a couple of issues here. I mean, I originally started getting involved with Bitcoin in 2011 and I was quite aware of the very first regulatory one of the very first regulatory proposals from FinCEN in 2013. Um, and I paid very close attention to that proposal and, and to a regulation. And one of the things they identified was decentralization or what they called uh, decentralized virtual currency. And it had some very strict requirements. And interestingly, the very few currency actually, um, cryptocurrencies actually met that. And you have to have no pre mines and no emissions that are given to founders. Um, which essentially involved money transmission. And there were very few currencies, cryptocurrencies that met it. And I, from memory, but I would say right now I'm on the top 20, I would, I would identify Bitcoin, Dogecoin, Bitcoin Cash, Litecoin, Monero. Monero is actually one of the most compliant currencies. If you actually looked at the original idea, because there's no pre mine, there's no funders award, there's no centralized entity issuing tokens. Um, and this is the whole issue behind the security issue, but also be behind money transmission, particularly in the United States. So there definitely has to be a very clear distinction between a truly decentralized virtual currency that is honestly, and on, what I would say, an honest cypherpunk. And what I have found in the industry, which quite honestly, I really sympathize with a lot of the regulators on, is that the, there are a very sizable number of what effectively can be called banks or unregistered securities masquerading as cypherpunks. And when regulators simply say a bank is a bank and we're going to treat it the same, they'll say, wait a minute, you know, we are decentralized. We're not really decentralized. You've got this centralized entity. And this is what we're targeting. So I think that's its distinction, which is very clearly delineated in the original FinCEN guidance of 2013 needs to be maintained. Are you decentralized? Are you really decentralized? Or are you pretending to be decentralized? There's a really fun acronym, which is a, like D-I-N-O, like Dino or Dino, that shows up for decentralized in name only in some regulatory publications. And I think it's a, a pretty good indicator of how much regulators are paying attention to that phenomenon that you mentioned. Yeah, Deanna, I want to bring you in because I know you've had a lot of interactions in sort of broader blockchain space, right, for lack of better words. Do they have the same worries regarding regulations, or are they sort of divorced from it, or are they more accepted of the compliance requirements that they may face moving forward? I suppose it depends what circles we're running in. Um, I would say, generally speaking, there is a difference between, of course, digital assets, cryptocurrency, and blockchain, but with what is really referred to as the distributed ledger technologies, DLTs. So I think at the you know the ISO definition was made you know five six years ago on that um, ISO the standards bodies. Then it went to I mean at the OECD where I've been doing a lot of work on frameworks for regulating across the you know the OECD countries. It is distributed ledger technology that is used as the language, and generally speaking, that's defined as anything any type of uh, solution that's using a distributed ledger where they do get stuck, and to bring it back to this point of decentralized versus centralized, is defining what distributed is, technically speaking, but also being able to prove that a network, in fact, is distributed and not centralized. Secondly, uh, if and when a, you know, an organization, a group of people, or a company in this case, becomes uh, it's quite aware that they're centralized, there really is an absence of regulation or what to do if it's a decentralized network. So it's quite easy to have a response in most states to regulating business entities. Actually, Justin, you brought that up with the US. Uh, the trajectory is also treating a lot of crypto asset, crypto asset companies as business entities themselves. Uh, so that's pretty straightforward when things are centralized. You know, you're not reinventing the wheel. We have already regulations and ways to deal with that. But when you're decentralized, there really is a, a gap in the absence of who is held accountable, 
Um, how do we ensure that there is essentially a way to be able to hold a network or a group of individuals accountable for any type of potential uh, issues that may come up. But importantly, I don't think that there will be regulations um, or filling the filling of the gap of, of decentralized communities, entities, you know, chains, because at that stage it becomes an entirely new ballgame. And I think generally speaking at OECD level that I've seen is also at the European Commission, uh, the US is also going towards this. It's, they'd rather leave a gray area and leave it undefined so that there is less, there's more ability to be able to police and uh, regulate kind of off the books. So I, think I, mean, that's the I don't think they're just leaving a gray area. They're actively expanding the gray area as it relates to decentralized exchanges, at least as it relates to money transmission activities. So in the United States, FinCEN has at least a pretty straightforward definition of what money transmission is. Of course, it's different in some countries. In fact, it's probably more blurred in Europe than the United States, just because in the US it's actually pretty well-defined overall. But with that type of definition, it may exclude certain types of more decentralized, less strictly Dino cases uh, for exchange services. And then that leads, leads regulators in a situation where there isn't a traditional party for them to go after to regulate for these types of activities. And then they really get worried because you know you have an ability for people to peer-to-peer -peer trade in large scale and with billions of dollars like they do, especially on Ethereum, right? A lot of people think that maybe Monero's the only main target of a lot of compliance stuff. That's actually not really true. It is in many ways used as a foil, but Ethereum and a lot of tokens, a lot of DEXs built on Ethereum definitely have been the main focus of a lot of AML related conversation because the volume is just so large. Uh, people aren't you know, trading billions of dollars with Monero like they are with Uniswap, right? So um, I think that there's this really ugly rush right now by jurisdictions who have the blessing of FATF with kind of a, a blank check of support from FATF saying you can redefine what money transmission means to include like all sorts of different items. Some regulators are kind of of the opinion that you start with a protocol and you work down until you find the most representative person and then they are responsible for the system if they're even a developer and aren't actually touching cash and things that typically would exclude you from a money transmitter definition. And I am really worried about that direction because it really is kind of a blank check to go against developers. And so I think that a lot of jurisdictions are going to have ugly battles for what counts as qualifying activities, covered entities, and those conversations I don't think are going to be resolved very soon. So I actually think, especially as it relates to Monero, which falls often under the, you know, there aren't really very great definitions of what privacy enhancing technology are strictly, right? Is it a ring signature? Is it the fact that you can change an address in Bitcoin each time? Is that a privacy feature, right? But what the regulators do is they look and say, well, we don't have an exact definition for it, but Monero very clearly is it, right? And so Monero really is in many ways the definition of a privacy technology for crypto. And to some extent, Amber, I think that optics are kind of, we're, we're kind of past that, right? There's only so much we can do on the optics front that people already use us as the Monero, as the foil of this is the big scary privacy thing, right? And uh, we could do the dash defense of saying that, oh, well, we're not a privacy coin, but it didn't work for them either, <laughs> right? But I, I agree with your broader point, especially for companies and you know the products and services they offer. Um, but uh, sorry, to wrap this, this point up, uh, because there's many different points here. Um, it, uh, I, I think the gray area is growing, actually, and I'm worried that because this gray area you know, continues to grow, Monero is often going to be not strictly disallowed, per se, in most jurisdictions at least, um, even though FATF would allow that type of, of jurisdiction or uh, legislation to be enforced um, and would agree with it. Um, but Instead, I think that the chaos with the big gray area is just going to result in most companies and services vying away from it like we've seen for the past five years for Monero. I, if, if I can add to that, FATF does uh, permit countries to prohibit. They can prohibit cryptocurrencies full scale. 
um, and they can um, prohibit specific categories. But the expectation is that if you have a prohibition, you have to have a concurrent enforcement. And so the idea is that if I'm nation A, I can't say I'm prohibiting and then just not enforce it. There has to be some kind of enforcement and then it's incumbent on the country to prove that that enforcement is somewhat effective in the context of their FATF mutual evaluations, which is how most of the countries are kind of measuring is our AML program at a national level working or not. Um, so prohibition for peer-to-peer -peer protocols has some challenges, as you can imagine. So it's kind of unpopular. Yeah, I think just to kind of sum this little topic up, it, it's probably fair to say that regulations require obliged entities and uh, the concept of obliged entities is, is kind of antithetical to decentralization. So there's a, there's a gray area there. We, we, we've talked or touched on, it's been mentioned privacy, so Andrea, I want to, I want to come to you. Like, so where does privacy come into the conversation? How do we deal with it? Where does it sit? How are they talking about it? I know, Amber, you've mentioned a little bit about the language being used, but Andrea, what's your perspective? Yeah, um, I want to expand a little bit about the language thing, because uh, actually I'm not a lawyer, but in the last year I read quite a bunch of, uh, of regulations, and uh, the first thing that is evident while reading this regulation is that it's not really, it's not really clear what regula uh, regulators and legislators mean with privacy. And uh, think, for example, about what we, uh, you were saying before about uh, uh, anonymity and enhancing technologies. Uh, this means basically that the assumption uh, that regulators make uh, is that everything is transparent by default. And, that, uh, and then after that, uh, you can add some, uh, some uh, anonymity and this move uh, uh, makes you somehow suspicious uh, because maybe, I don't know, you try to hide something uh, from, uh, uh, from regulators. Or uh, I was reading uh, last couple of months the uh, GDPR, the European Regulation on, uh, uh, on Data Protection. And uh, again, it is very interesting, for example, that, the, uh, that uh, this regulation deals with privacy, but the word privacy doesn't really appear in that regulation. They talk a lot about uh, data protection, and uh, in theory, this regulation is meant to help users, uh, to help individuals to uh, protect their personal data. But in fact, if you read it, you will find a lot of clauses where basically um, uh, the GDPR create a lot of exceptions um, uh, where a public institution and private institution basically can uh, exploit personal data without even asking con uh, the consent of the individual. So, in theory, it is a regulation that is meant to uh, protect personal data, but in fact they uh, legalize uh, the, um, the use, for example, of personal data uh, um, uh, even without the consent of, uh, of the individual, and usually they use very general uh, terms, like for example, uh, public security or legitimate interest uh, in order to uh, basically uh, give a pass uh, to uh, the use of uh, uh, personal information by uh, third-party entities. So, uh, how these regulations are written is, uh, 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 is uh, very striking and uh, uh, the language is very interesting uh, to, uh, and it, it, is, it is very important to read them in order to try to understand the mindset that regulators adopt, because if we can understand that mindset, then we can react appropriately. Um, one of the things that's kind of behind the scenes and is these assumptions. One of the assumptions, is, for example, is that Bitcoin is traceable. Um, and to put it mildly, I mean, Bitcoin has built in anonymity functions if people don't want to accept them there by design. I mean, essentially what you have is anonymous uh, public keys or hashes of public keys. What's behind all of this is the private industry um, known as blockchain surveillance, which, and they find that certain, that they can, this presented to our regulators, we can surveil the blockchain, we can do all this chain analytics, chain analysis, and all this kind of stuff. And tell the right, the tell a person, uh, a law enforcement officer, with an undefined degree of certainty whether or not a particular address is, is related to a criminal activity or terrorist financing, etc., or sanctions evasion. And the reliability of these tools are not known. Um, they're kept quiet and proprietary. Um, and what Monero has done very effectively is it makes it blatantly obvious that these tools don't work in Monero. And that's kind of the implied 
definition of anonymity enhanced cryptocurrency or privacy coin, it's really, we have basically made it obvious that a tool that doesn't really work in Bitcoin doesn't work in Monero. Um, and that tends to be what's kind of vaguely written into a lot of the regulations. So a great example of this is um, in the EU um, MICA, uh, this is a particular article where it says uh, it defines anonymity and um, uh, enhancement and anonymity enhancements and built in anonymization features. So, what? Well, what is the built in anonymization feature? Does that mean it, it applies to Bitcoin? Or is it simply, well, it's really obvious that this blockchain service doesn't work, which is basically you're applying it to Monero. And, uh, and this is, I think, an issue which is going to be more significant once more questions are asked about these tools uh, and more questions are asked about how reliable they are and in fact then the argument becomes you really want to use Monero not to hide crime but to prevent yourself from being falsely accused. So okay, the narrative suddenly changes to um, I'm not comfortable using Bitcoin because I have no control what happens to whoever I provide my Bitcoin to, if they then turn around and do something untoward or something illegal, then I'm going to be accused of, or, or associated with that activity. I can protect myself by using Monero, but not by using Bitcoin. And then it's a perfect example. A credit card, for example, is more deterministic. You don't have that same problem. But uh, this, this is, a, I think, an underlying question. And I expect it's going to become a lot more visible in, in the future and a lot more questions are going to be asked. Yeah, just just to jump in and to touch on what Andrea was talking about as well with personal data, I think it, in the world of data protection, anonymization functions or pseudonymization functions or, or inbuilt anonymization functions um, are usually a positive thing. They improve the level of data protection that's uh, given to the data subject. But in the financial space, uh, the tools that are used to improve the level of, of privacy affordance to the data subjects is now a bad thing. And, and there just, there, there seems a mismatch there that hasn't been resolved. And I'm not sure if it will ever be resolved because I think there are fundamental tensions with actually the regulators as well uh, and, and, and the two sectors as they sort of collide. Um, from a European perspective, like there are distinctions, clear distinctions between your fundamental right to privacy and your fundamental right to data protection. There's overlap. And, and a lot of the commentary and a lot of the, the work that's been done tries to understand the level of interaction between those two concepts, i.e. data protection and privacy. But it's very blurred. Uh, and, and it'll probably remain pretty blurred because it's not quite clear where one starts and, and the other ends. Uh, Please, uh, there. Uh, yeah. And another question that we should ask about this, uh, uh, this, uh, this problem is, is privacy really a right? Because uh, uh, there is this talk about uh, fundamental rights. Is, it, is a fundamental right the same thing as a natural right? Or it is just a positive right that uh, should be protected by an institution? Or maybe there is someone that uh, um, thinks that privacy is not really a right, but it is just a, con a condition to protect uh, some information that you want to protect or to protect something. So uh, there are also these very deep philosophical questions behind these, uh, these regulations and uh, uh, that are not addressed, but uh, that somehow show up uh, when, uh, 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 when these regulations are written. So, uh, Just to further that a little and also add to the, the context, it's ever-changing and it's dependent on each regulatory environment as well. When we're talking data privacy, there's consumer data protection, there's financial data privacy, there is data privacy associated with our own personal uh, data as well in the healthcare sector. Each set of these different types of data are dealt, different, dealt with differently in every regulatory market. There isn't a consistent definition across the board, even if they're now starting to be definitions. And when it comes to exactly that, is privacy a fundamental human right? And is financial privacy a fundamental human right? So it even goes even deeper, further into um, sounds quite pedantic, but it really, like the policy working group, a lot of what we do, a lot of what we will continue to do is literally write definitions or try to influence how things are being defined. And now you're starting to see the more, uh, these more, the terminology that also are to mind that you brought up there, right? The anonymity enhancing tools. That was not a part of regulatory context two or three years ago, but we know that 
quite a lot of the blockchain surveillance companies have a seat at the table. They are lobbying. They have the money. They have the resources to sit there, sit in that room and define or even get these definitions on the table in the first place. What we're left doing is scrambling to try to both educate and help to either reduce that definition to not be as general as it is to say, for example, in the distributed discussion we were having earlier, a distributed network, if you if it in any way becomes a part of this regulatory framework, then every single developer that's worked on it, according to us, you know, certain definitions could be liable for the work they've done. It just becomes so broad, we're trying to narrow it in the further defining area, like we're really in a, just an area of defining things at this stage. Okay, so I mean, I mean looking forward, Amber, what, what's the horizon looking like? I I don't think we're going to see less regulation. Um, if, if that was what anyone wanted to hear, I'm sorry, this is not your day. Um, I, I think that we're going to see more interest from regulators. I think that we're going to see more dialogue. Um, I, I expect that we'll start to see some action come out of Europe, but for the time being, uh, most of the harshest regulatory action is going to be just uh, what I like to refer to as the boot of American imperialism. Um, but I, I think that we are going to see those harsh actions continuing to come out of the US, uh, particularly where there are um, interactions with anything, so US dollars, persons, soil. Uh, it's one of the things that I warn my clients the most about as a, as a Canadian and a compliance practitioner in Canada, is that if you want to serve that market, you need to play by the rules. And we see very different types of regulatory action, so uh, for instance, uh, there will be undercover um, individuals in law enforcement in the U.S. that will reach out to exchanges and say, hey, I'd like to do this transaction with you and it's in cash. And they're super blatant about it, by the way. Like, if you ever get a phone call and you're like, wow, was that a, an undercover agent that was really bad at their job? No, nope, they were good at their job. They need it to be so obvious that in court, a judge reads that transcript and says, yes, it was clear that this is someone talking about crime and you agreed to perpetrate crime for them. So you agreed to do an exchange for them anonymously without any KYC, without any ID. They made it clear that they were in the US. They made it clear that it was proceeds of credit card fraud, whatever the thing is. And, and those are the cases. So oftentimes when you see that there was an extradition order or someone was arrested in the US, if you go deeper into those transcripts, those are the type of things that we're looking at. I don't think that we've seen an end to those cases. I think that we're going to continue to see that and that um, at one of the unfortunate points of tension is that technology is global and it's instant and regulation is local and it's very specific and it's different in each jurisdiction. We're starting to see more and more, um, and, and thank you so much, Deanna, for participating in those conversations because it's really important work. Um, we're starting to see more and more conversations about how do we standardize globally? How do we lean more into things like ISO standards and bring them into our local regulation? And I, I would love to see more of that harmonization in my lifetime because frankly it makes business easier. Um, but right now it's hard. And I think um, those are some of the efforts that we can do that are useful. Uh, and we will see more of it, hopefully, uh, hopefully in my lifetime, in a meaningful way. Uh, but for, for the foreseeable future, there's still a lot of tension in terms of those local level requirements. And understanding those in all of the jurisdictions in which you're doing business is going to continue to be important. So more regulations. Uh, Francisco, to turn to you, what's your, what's your worry about? Well, my biggest worry right now is the singling out of Monero for the very reason I kind of mentioned before, because it kind of exposes the failure of uh, blockchain surveillance in a very blatant way, and when in fact it doesn't work even in Bitcoin. Um, interestingly enough, um, of one of the uh, proposals or responses from the from us from the Monero policy um, uh, working group. Um, the one that actually we supported what was proposed to, to a significant degree was the one from FinCEN in the United States. Um, and the reason was is because they basically were proposing that we treat cryptocurrency the same way you would treat any other fungible assets such as cash or, or bearer bonds or um, and people know what bearer bonds are, you know, a bit of gray hairs, it's like cash-like instruments um, that are involved. And, um, and, we, and effectively actually questioned 
the, um, the, the potential effectiveness of blockchain surveillance. Uh, and in particular, I questioned it in the case of very large blockchains, such as implying Ethereum. Um, and so it was one of the few that we actually supported, and this, I think the only one we supported, and we were, uh, the Monetary Policy Group, actually fairly unique in supporting that, um, which is interesting too. There were a lot of people in the, in the Bitcoin community who wanted to be given leniency um, with respect to regulation by supporting this type of blockchain surveillance. So and we said, no, 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 no. Uh, we support, go ahead to travel rule, which is what regulators want to treat it the same as, as, uh, um, as you would treat cash. Um, and make it clear and obvious. Yes, you have to do KYC for uh, uh, when you're dealing with institutions, etc. So that's kind of the distinction. So one of my biggest concerns is that we're kind of giving too much um, credibility to this idea that certain companies can just go in there and surveil Ethereum, particularly, or blockchain, or Bitcoin blockchain, and kind of give um, uh, regulators a sort of false sense of security. This is evil, this is bad. This is good, based on an unknown set of statistics and also unknown assumptions or heuristics, um, with no date, with no uh, transparency, how these results are, are reached. And, and what you end up with is a tool that can very easily generate um, false positives, which effectively become false accusations of innocent people. And that's, uh, I think, a very serious problem if we rely on obscure and hidden technologies to kind of determine guilt or innocence. Just to jump in to make, make it clear, I think, as far as I remember, we supported the reporting requirements for bearer instruments, and then even, even more provocative, and it took quite a, quite a few long discussions. I'm gonna bring Justin in, because I'm sure you can remember. We also supported the travel rule, actually, in one of our responses. Uh, we wanted to find the travel rule, maybe? Yeah, so for those of you who don't know, so it essentially came from uh, FADF or FinCEN, where they essentially uh, propose a requirement for virtual asset service providers to um, record um, a set of data points for any transfer from a custodial wallet to a uh, self-hosted wallet. I think, was that the language? No, it's only in Switzerland, really. Uh, so between two exchanges. So it's between two regular. Did they not also want to? Did they not also want to make a record of any transaction to a self-hosted wallet? That would be in the United States, separate from a travel rule. I see. But we supported that action too, if I remember correctly. So <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna take a small step back here. So there was a lot of stuff in the FinCEN midnight rulemaking. This is a few years ago. At this point, this is old news. But um, we, as a work group, opposed almost everything in there. But the key distinction between what our work group said and what every other lobbyist for the cryptocurrency, uh, on behalf of some form of some type of cryptocurrency community said, um, they argued that the certain limits uh, for transaction activities were irrelevant or, or incorrect for cryptocurrencies because the risks are otherwise mitigated and a big reason for that is because blockchain analytics tools exist to mitigate these risks. Now, if you have a Monero hat on or are aware that a Monero community exists, you would think, okay, well, how are Monero risks mitigated, right? And so um, we didn't want to be left behind and thrown under the bus and say, well, we want to, we have blockchain analytics, we can support this limit on these assets, but you can't support Monero at all because we don't have these mitigating factors. That's the exact opposite of what we wanted. So our work group was unique in saying that we support uh, reporting requirements and, uh, and KYC requirements that are equivalent to cash deposit uh, amounts because it's a similar bearer asset with privacy, with similar privacy properties. And we argued that you cannot rely upon blockchain analytics tools to be reliable enough to impose lower thresholds for assets that have some sort of visibility because the frank truth is that sophisticated attackers who are good at laundering money are not going to be caught by an automated AML risk tool in the vast majority of cases. And so they're not going to be caught with this risk mitigation measure. And so you shouldn't 
built that into a separate only for crypt, you know, transparent crypto only special lane thing. So we argued against crypto having its own special lane from that perspective. Um, so that's, that's the context there. That was different than the travel rule. The travel rule, I don't think there's been, there is mostly an exchange opposition in the cryptocurrency realm, as far as I understand, against the technology implementation of this. And certain jurisdictions, most notably Switzerland, decided that the travel rule should not only apply in their interpretation to transfers between two exchanges, um, they also felt that you would need to, as a recipient of funds in your non-custodial wallet, prove for that particular transaction that you have ownership of that particular wallet and some other similar types of requirements, which is why you have uh, controversial things in the Bitcoin space about uh, you know, signing that you own a wallet and, and like certain types of protocols to that effect, which are unpopular and uh, you know among the samurai wallet community, for example. Um, one of the things with this is if you look at the difference between a cash transaction and, say, for example, a cryptocurrency transaction. In order to be able to enforce travel rule where you would normally enforce it, i.e., transfers between um, uh, different uh, regulated entities, you also have to know if you're sending funds to uh, a non-custodial wallet that is owned by one of your clients, you have to have a way of verifying that that wallet is actually owned by your client. Surprisingly, and this is one interesting thing that um, I learned this from uh, the fiat world in the United States actually, is that with a currency such as Monero where you hide the transaction amounts, there's actually a very simple way to mitigate that risk and that is to send test transactions to the wallet, which you can only figure out if you actually have the view key of that wallet. Kind of with sending a small amount of money to a bank account or withdrawing a small amount of money to a credit card in order to verify that that person actually is the, holder, the legitimate holder of the credit card to a level of risk. And I, and I, and I said that it's not 100%, but it does mitigate risk. Um, and that's a unique case where you can use Monero, where you cannot use virtually any other cryptocurrency because Monero hides the transaction from us. So you can actually do that. So I think that's why a bit of the confusion arises. In order to enforce travel rule in um, cryptocurrency, you also have to know about these wallets that someone withdraws on their own account. Is that the wallet of my client that I've already done my KYC and due diligence on, et cetera? Or is it some third party wallet that I really need to apply travel rule to? Or I need to. Um, and also, when you withdraw into a non hostile wallet, it's kind of equivalent to somebody walking into a bank and cashing the check paid to them. That person still is going to be KYC. So you have to worry about knowing. Um, from the perspective of the VASP, that you're dealing with uh, an individual that you're going to need to have to KYC, just as if you go to a bank to catch a check, you would be expected to provide identification, etc., to the bank, um, even though the check is made payable to you. So I think that's the subtlety. Yes, it's a different regulation in the United States, but you have to do something about these wallets in order to ensure that you can also enforce travel. Okay, so uh, Andrea and Diana, I want to bring you two both back in here. So, I mean, what should we do moving forward? Like, what, what's a plan of action? Do we have a plan of action? Well, uh, that's a very difficult question because, I mean, obviously uh, we are living a market process and the market process cannot be planned and therefore it is uh, open-ended and uh, it is a, a bottom-up process. But uh, probably, uh, we should just, uh, in my opinion, this is just my opinion, of course, we should, we, we, we should just focus on who we are. And basically, uh, we uh, just need to focus on building uh, a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system and, uh, uh, and to focus on uh, transactions that happen and, uh, uh, at a peer-to-peer -peer level. Even all this discussion uh, has been, so far, uh, um, focused a lot, uh, and, right, and rightfully so, on a um, transaction that uh, involves some, some sort of intermediary. But, uh, and uh, most regulations deal, uh, deal with intermediaries in the crypto ecosystem. But uh, just remember that, uh, that the cryptocurrencies are meant to uh, enable peer-to-peer -peer, uh, 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 peer -peer cash-like transactions. And, um, and therefore we should focus on that. And um, I, I also want to borrow, uh, borrow something from uh, Amir Taki uh, and, for, and from his talk uh, this morning. I think that it is kind of in it, uh, inevitable that uh, uh, in the future, I don't know when, but in the future there will be a sort of split between uh, traditional finance and uh, dark finance. 
and uh, between the white markets and black markets. And uh, we should be uh, really ready uh, 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 when the moment comes. We should be really ready to uh, uh, live a kind of double life. Uh, a life on white markets and uh, that interacts with, uh, with institutions and on the other end uh, a life on uh, black and dark markets. This is how I see it. Yeah, I think I'll build on that to a sense. Um, I think we need to safeguard this space. We've built, a, we've built an alternative together. We've got a network that can be used that can fundamentally in the next era of technology and in the future of where even digital assets is heading and decentralized communities is heading and where even you know censorship free <laughs> interactions in a market or in, in any uh, ecosystem Monero can be and right now is the most technically viable tool that can provide that alternative I think what we can do now as Monero policy working group as a bigger Monero community is safeguard and protect that space I don't necessarily think we're going to be making gains in legitimatizing that space nor making it the main um, path for for the world, but it will be here for those that are coming into this with us. That you know, our community is growing and will continue to grow. And I think a lot of people will will wake up one day and see this and, and migrate over as well. And on that note, when it comes specifically within the context of, of regulation and policy, um, I think we've done a really good job at the Monero Policy Working Group. I have to say, in legitimatizing our working group and our and our community within the regulatory space. We're not just shilling crypto, we're not out there, and Amber, your point is very valid at the beginning about what the crypto community says at large and how we can, you know, how the negative uh, kind of look of what, what a lot of people say and throw out there. Uh, but what we've been doing, I think, is really legitimizing this narrow community by providing, you know, academically sound, technically sound, uh, rational and educated responses to policies that affect not just the crypto asset and digital asset space but the privacy space more generally and also looking at it from a perspective of uh, a community of people that are looking to build and looking to create more not from a you know we're the we're the black market of of crypto and everybody that you know we, it's, it's less of a uh, fuck you message that we would normally see in a space like this and more of a we need to exist and this is a fundamental human right financial privacy is a fundamental human right and furthermore this is a technically sound and viable technology that can fit within the regulatory and policy frameworks that are being introduced and by the way we want to help define that as we move and I think in a nutshell that's what we can do and continue to do and we welcome anybody that wants to join on that journey and also from an individual perspective whether you're part of this group or not per, you know providing that message and putting that out there and, and being a legitimate community like we are i think really is helping our cause yeah i definitely agree with what Deanna's saying um one thing i do want to say though is that monero's fate on a regulatory perspective is in most ways or in the most important way, in my opinion, entirely in its own hands. Um, there is not going to be a case where some compliance committee gets together and decides that Monero is okay and should exist and should be on all exchanges and things like that. They're not going to be like, okay, Monero is great. We listened to what the policy work group was going to say, and they were all really, really smart, and they were right, and therefore... You should be able to get Monero anywhere, and you know, with, with all reasonable ways to use it and the like. There's not a, there's not going to be a committee that just agrees on that from an anti-money laundering perspective. It's just not going to happen. So, given that, given that that's not just going to be this great blessing that comes from nowhere, um, the fate of Monero, whether it's going to be an easier conversation on our end, or if Monero is going to be consistently shoved to the side and it's constantly going to be an uphill battle to get in people's memory and be really annoying to keep getting into conversations, is going to be entirely dependent on the adoption on Monero and to the extent that they can ignore Monero or not. If Monero is a small asset that only has a small niche community and not too many people use it and there are no other cryptocurrency assets that are really like it, then we're going to keep running into situations where regulators either purposefully or accidentally forget that Monero exists and laws are going to be either written entirely to exclude Monero or in a way that is ultimately, you know, is written in a way to encourage people to exclude Monero, either out of ignorance or malice, right? And so 
The only way to really change that in a large scale is to force their hand so it is top of mind and they say, oh yeah, we actually do need comprehensive changes to these regs that isn't going to ignore that Monero exists and needs to acknowledge Monero for all of its uh, privacy properties and all of its features that it has and be able to actually make adequate appropriate policies that address this head on instead of trying to like start with Bitcoin and then maybe adapt it to Monero kind of in, in certain ways, which ultimately results in nothing happening. Um, this policy working group, I think, you know, our primary focus has been, you know, reminding people that Monero exists. That's really the first start, reminding people of Monero's properties, uh, making firm lines that we think are really important. Um, like for example, don't ban Monero is a pretty basic thing. And it's a really bad policy and maybe, uh, you know, in reference to the slide behind, maybe you don't need ID face verification for $1 cryptocurrency purchases, if that's what your compliance program looks like. Maybe you need a slightly better compliance program that's a little bit more anchored to risks, perhaps. Um, but, um, you know, ultimately, none of, like, we can only do so much if Monero remains a small niche asset. So focusing on building Monero, you really do need to force regulators' hands. So it's no longer just some side thing that is kind of annoying every once in a while when we show up. It's, it needs to be something that is top of mind for them and then they need to realize, okay, we need much better rules for this. We need much better strategies than just, you know, trying to ban it or, you know, whatever some people might come up with. Okay, so, so thanks Justin and, and Diana. So a bit of pessimism and a bit of optimism. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I, I think we're kind of done there, unless anyone else has some closing remarks, we could probably take some questions from the audience or, or observations.